Hey everyone, we are live. So a couple minutes till we actually start, but I wanted to make sure that this was up and running in plenty of time. Because last time there were a few little hiccups with it and this time looks like we might be gone. We'll see. All right, so as I can now see that we're going over here. Welcome everybody to the first top 10 board game top 10 that I'm doing here. A fatal paper cut. Welcome to the top 10. So first time doing one of these. It's going to be kind of fun. Um, and the topic that won was small box games. And I say won because there was a tie between competitive or cooperative and small box games. So I just picked small box games out of the two because there are more cooperative games on the list or lists out there probably. And I'm going to do a cooperative one at some point in time. But I have more cooperative games than I do small box games. So this one was easier to throw together. Maybe uh, next next Monday I'll do cooperative games as I've had more of a chance to plan out that list. So before we get to our top 10 Let's talk about Aqua Fuzz. So Indeed Brewing Company is based out of Minneapolis here. They also have a location in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but started 10 minutes from my house, which is a lot of fun. Uh, it's, I love the fact that we have a lot of breweries near where I live, and this is a hazy IPA. So, we've talked before about IPAs, to some extent, with how they can, they tend to be bitter, and like you have the bitterness from the hops, and but then sometimes you also have a hoppy flavor to it, and that's just the two different ways of using the hops. These hazy IPAs um, basically come from... I want to say a few years ago, there were a lot of companies, three, maybe four years ago, a lot of breweries started to do uh, IPAs with less of the citrusy hops than uh, the kind of more like... Uh, tropical flavored hops so you kind of have that tropical you have citrus and you have piney and uh yeah welcome studio aniston fermented hops bitter question mark explanation point yeah just a wee bit bitter but only if you put them in at the very beginning of the boil if you put them in right at the end they're flavorful so the hazy IPA kind of grew out of this uh, tropical hop renaissance, or them being, being uh, brought into more of the mainstream. This kind of led to these hazy IPAs where I'm not sure that this one is, but for some of them, Some of them are going to be cut with like a juice of some sort to kind of give it more of that hazy golden color and give it more of that tropical flavor. And so that's a little bit of the history of hazy IPAs, as much as I know of it anyways. So let's start talking about board games. 
top 10 small box games. So when I say small box, let me grab something here. This, which is a pretty small box, was too big for what I considered a small box. Even smaller, still too big. So I'm going with some pretty small boxes here for the most part. And I will say I did not do any roll and writes, which are all up behind me here, simply because I've played enough that I'm going to do a top 10 roll and write list at some point in time. So this is basically every other part of my collection, but not the roll and writes. So. Let's hop into this with number 10. So number 10 took forever for me to actually find it. It is Parade by Z-Man Games. And in this game, you are trying to score the fewest points possible. Haven't even taken this one out of shrink because I've always played somebody else's copy. But this is one that my wife likes a lot as well. So it made it an easy one that when we were able to find it, grabbed it real fast. Come on. Don't make me get the knife on you. Yes, whenever I say the word hop, it is in reference to hops, not rabbits. So we have a whole bunch of cards in a number of different colors. The number on the card tells you how far back, so like this is the number one. In a line of cards, I would say this was the card out here, number two. I play down the number one, and I would count back one spot. Then I would take any cards that match the color or were less than value of this. So you're trying to get as few points as possible in this game. So there's a little bit of fun card play from your hand, but what I really like about the game is it gives you it gives you kind of the trick-taking option of shooting the moon. So like in hearts, if you take every single trick, everybody else gets the points. In this case, if you have the most of a color, that color is all worth one point per card for you versus face value. So it ends up giving you a whole like a whole little bit of strategy of you start taking one color, you really try and push that uh, further. So my number 10 small box game is Parade. The next one has a similarly fancy cover and it's just a box full of coasters. And that is Skull. Yes, an egg person would be exceedingly freaky. Oh, this is hilarious. This is a punch board of the pieces of Skull. Let me punch out one of these and demonstrate what they look like to you. Uh, two of them, I guess. I'm not sure why that's in a punch board. So, Skull is a trick-taking game. Or a bluffing game. 
And this rulebook has to be in like five languages because there's no way that this, sh well, two languages anyways. Because this is a very simple game. So everybody has their own set of coasters. On their coasters, the majority of them are skulls, but then, let me see if I can find them. There are roses or flowers as well. So on your turn, you do one of a few things, or two things really. You either play down either a skull or a flower. Okay, maybe it's, everybody has one skull. Yep, yeah, one skull. Or a flower. So you play down a skull or a flower and you don't show what it is. You're just playing these coasters face down. At some point in time, somebody will call for a bid and they'll be like all right i can flip over four coasters without flipping over a skull and then you can go around and you raise the number or lower the number as you see fit or raise the number this is bidding you only ever go up and the trick is you have to flip all of your own first so you know if you have a skull in yours but do you bluff to try and get somebody to go further or to think that you don't have any in yours so they'll flip their own first and then flip yours and bust or do you think that you're about at the end of the bidding so just stop there and see what happens and hope that somebody busts. It's very fast and very fun and Skull is a good game for playing your opponents. This is one of those games where it's like you're really trying to read what they are doing. Next one up is very sparkly and that is Claim. So I have a bunch of trick-taking games, and this is number eight. But Claim is one of, one of the few that I've gotten to the table. Kind of the reason being is trick-taking games, I feel like, take a certain group of people or a certain person to play them with. If you're on unequal footing in terms of trick taking, it can go real bad fast. Claim is a super fast and short one. You basically are playing two hands and only the second hand counts for scoring. There is like no trump card or suit that will determine an automatic win. Instead, all the suits are different fantasy races. So the first hand of cards you play, you're playing to build your second hand of cards. If, so you flip over a card in the middle and that's the card you're playing for to build that second hand. If you win the hand, you get that card in the middle. If you lose the hand, it gets you or your opponent gets that card and you get the one off the top of the deck. So if you're in a situation where there's a lousy card, say a one out in the middle, you're going to be trying to lose that hand to get the one or yeah, that hand trick to get that one off the top of the deck because it's probably going to be better. And then you play that second hand with the, what you've built from the first hand, and it's basically just a majority in suits. Whoever has the majority in more suits wins. Plays super fast. The fantasy races each have powers, so that can change it up. And so, like, 
I only have my claim right here, but I also own claim two and three of the six, I think, reinforcements, which basically just add in more suits that you can swap in and swap out. Time for a drink. So, we're on to number seven. Number seven is like claim in the fact that I have a whole bunch of it. However, the gameplay is actually more like one that I grew up playing with a deck of cards, and that is the silver amulet, or silver bullet, or silver coin, or silver dagger. All of them are basically the same game. You have, and you can mix and match between them. So you have in front of you five cards laid down, and that is your village. You are trying to get the lowest possible score in your village to win the twin, basically. And the whatever score you have in there is probably going to be your points. Except that, again, like Claim, each of these has powers. So, with their powers, one of them might be, all right, the six allows you to flip a card face up in your village. And that's useful because you only know two of the cards, which you've predetermined, or which you've looked at, at the very beginning of the game. You flip them over and be like, all right, these two, flip them back down, and you have to remember what's going on there. Plus, some of the lower number cards have powers that work when they're flipped face up in your village. And so you're trying to get as many low number cards, well, five or less low number cards into your village so that you're scoring very few points. And with that five or less, how do you get less? So you can swap out two cards of the same number for an another card. So there will be times where blindly, I know I have a 10, I'll put another 10 into my village so I can have two of the same number to knock them out, even if I'm making it go up right then. There's a lot of fun strategy. This is very much a has elements of take that in the game. Um, you're stealing opponent's cards and swapping them with their own. Uh, there's some that just, this one is less mean, but there's some that are pretty mean in how they work in there. And like, you know what you're getting into in that game and probably about a 20 minute game, 25 minutes. There's actually even a pretty good app for this game. So my number six is silver or silver amulet, bullet, coin, dagger. Any of them are a lot of fun. Next up, we have the only true solo game on the list. I guess technically it can be played with two. <laughs> yes, this is Studio Madison just realized this is an R2-D2 shirt. It's an R2-D2 shirt with all the details are Star Wars images. But my number six is Onirum, or Onirum, depending on how you pronounce it. This one, there's a lot of people who actually prefer the solo version of the game, or not the solo, the app version of the game, because there's a lot of shuffling in Oniram. 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 I call it Oniram. And that can be annoying at times. However, I really like it because I don't have to think that much while I play the game. I'm mainly just shuffling and then 
playing out hands, shuffling. It's a really good one for like if I'm watching a show or a movie that I'm only somewhat interested in or that I maybe have seen before. It allows me to maintain more engagement and not just sit there looking at my phone because I already know the movie. And it does offer some interesting challenges because you're playing out cards in a row, trying to get three of a color next to each other to find these doors. However, the symbols can't match when you play them down. So if one symbol is a triangle, another symbol is a crescent moon, I can't go crescent moon, crescent moon, triangle, I'd ha but I could do crescent moon, triangle, crescent moon to be able to get some stuff or get a card out. And then there are nightmares that are trying to mess with what you're doing. And you have a few different ways to deal with them. Now, most of the time you have these really powerful cards called keys that allow you to just play a door if you find it, or they just allow you to ignore a nightmare. You just discard it, draw a new card, ignore the nightmare. But there are a few other things that you could do as well. You could get rid of a door that you found already, so you have to do it again. Or you could discard your hand or discard five off the top. It just depends on the situation. So you have to really be able to play that situation well. Really fun one. Good solo game. Good small box too for a solo game that offers some interesting choices and a lot of fun. So my number five, as we get into the top half, so the good games on the list, I've never actually beaten this game. My number five is Say Bye to the Villains. Say Bye to the Villains is a cooperative game where you're playing as samurai dealing with members of the Yakuza. However, like you know when the fight is going to take place, you just don't know who you're going to be fighting. You know who's going to be showing up, but you get a pair off with who you're going to be fighting and they have cards that modify what they're doing and you have cards that you can use to modify what you're doing. Basically you have 10 points worth of time to train and the cards have different values on them. So as the samurai, you can play a card that gives you infinite speed. So you will always act before the villain, but that costs four time. So is that worth it? Or there's one that gives you infinite health. Again, four time, villain won't be able to kill you, but will you ha then have enough attack to be able to kill them? It makes it a really interesting puzzle and the fact that the villains have blind cards that you can look at to try and figure out who's going to be the best person to deal with that villain. But again, that takes time for your samurai. So it's one that I feel like in probably about the 20 to, yeah, probably about the 20 times that I've played it maybe with the exception of like three or four of those times, we have beaten every single villain except one. And that was just because we couldn't find out quite enough information. And sometimes that information even is, oh, you don't need to beat this villain. You just need to tie them. If you beat them, you lose. So that can be a touch frustrating when the win condition changes for that villain, but it is really interesting and each samurai has their own special powers, 
that play out differently. Each villain also has their own special things. That makes it a whole lot of fun. So my number five, say bye to the villains. Yeah, it's... So Fatal Paper Cut asked, so there's a bit of deduction. Um, it's less deduction and more resource management. Like, you are really trying to manage how you are using your time so you can most efficiently get everybody set up as well as look as at as many cards as possible. Because the villain deck is probably almost, well, probably about 150 cards. And most games you're using 25 to 30 of them. So that alternate win condition might not even be in there, if that makes sense. So while we see if that makes sense, I'll take another sip of beer. Try not to lose another coaster. So, my phone tells me faster than the streaming service that uh, Fatal says it sounds pretty neat, not gonna lie. It is a pretty fun one. It's a very small game, but it takes a little bit of time to play, which I think for some people the payoff of how long it is to what you're doing can feel off. It's only about a 35 to 40 minute game, but it looks a little bit more like it should be filler length. So number four is one of the new ones I found last year, and it is Cross Clues. This has nothing to do with Fallout, which I think is the one that the uh, graphics remind me of the most. This is a party game, a family party game basically, that is really fun and does something very smart that a lot of party games don't do. Uh, one of my biggest beefs with party games is they often have limited replayability. The game gives you a clue or card or I mean, apples to apples and cards against humanity are two great examples of this. You get a card that says, most likely to be a duck. Let's just say it's that. Everybody plays out another card from their hand to compare it against. That's, and whoever has the funniest one wins. That's kind of how a lot of them go. And that gets boring after a while because the second time you hit the card, most likely to be a duck, well if you're playing with a large enough group, the same cards might get played. So I have another one that didn't quite make the list, Stipulations, which I like better, that kind of does some of the same style of things but makes people be creative and ch you can change it up and tailor it to the group. This one doesn't allow you to change it up and tailor it to the group. This one actually has everything done via cards, but you have this grid and you have these intersections. So like A1 and B1. So, under each of these inter or under each of these axes, so A, B, C, D, and one, two, three, four are going to be a word. So under A might be stick, and under one might be wind, and then you're drawing cards giving clues based off of the intersections. So if I draw something that said A1, 
I'd have to give a one-word clue, and I can say something like kite. So if somebody guesses, or if the group cooperatively guesses, oh, this is A1, then it goes down there. Otherwise, face down, they don't know what they missed, gets set off to the side. Doesn't sound too tricky until you get all sorts of weird things. Now, what if I had wind? Or let's say, what if I had stick and tail? And those both intersect with wind. Well, which one's going to be kite? You have to think about your clues in a really interesting way that a lot of party games don't and it makes you think about stuff but it also keeps you talking a whole lot more than say something like the smash hit codenames does i think codenames suffers that it's it's played at parties but isn't really a party game this one does some of the same kind of clever things and has much more of a party game feel. So my number four small box game is Cross Clues. Then we're coming up to another new game. And this one is also in a very small box. That is Ohanami. So Ohanami, I like a lot because of how very simple it is. In Ohanami, you're drafting cards. And I like, I like drafting games a lot. I'm a big fan of Sushi Go Party. I really like the drafting piece of Blood Rage. And any game that can kind of add a little bit of drafting or for the variability, is a lot of fun. This one has you drafting two cards and it uses a super simple concept. You draft those two cards and you have three columns in front of you and you put your two cards into your columns. That's it. Well, kind of. There's a few little twists on it that make it really interesting. So, The trick is, the first trick, the big one, is that the numbers always have to be higher or lower than the higher or lowest in a given column. So I could have three columns, and if one of them's low is a 20, another one is a 40, and another one is a 50, and I take the 38 card, I can put it in either the 50 column at the bottom, or in the 40 column at the bottom and you're trying to build these out because these are going to give you points. The points are also a fun little twist. There's three different hands of drafting, so very standard of Sushi Go, but nothing you have in front of you ever resets. So you're always still just adding to what you've been doing. And the first hand, only the blues score, and they score you three points. Second hand, the blue and green score. The blue scores you three, green scores you four. Third hand, blue, green, and gray score. Blue scores you three, green scores you four, gray scores you seven. So there's a push and pull of when you want to draft these things, but also not creating massive gaps or getting all the numbers, high and lows, very similar so you can't slot in cards in the middle. That works really well. And then you add in pink, and pink basically, again, only scores at the end of the game, so like gray, but the more pink you have, the more points you get for it. So I'll actually just pull this out right here. So for one pink card, you get one point. For two, you get three. 
if you have 14, you get 105. And in a game where winning scores tend to be mid to upper 100s, that could push you over the top. And the games are super fast. It says 20 minutes. They play in 20 minutes or less. I've played two player games of this that we knocked it probably the whole thing out in 15 minutes. So my number three is Ohanami. So now we are down to the top two. And I won't lie, one of these, I was debating whether or not it was small enough. And I decided it was. My number two is a little game called Point Salad. So if you're watching this, and those of you watching it live, I suspect you know what a Point Salad game is. I'm going to quickly explain what that is. A point salad game is basically any game where everything you do gives you points. It's kind of like how salads literally can have everything in them and still be qualified as a salad somehow. Jello salads, which are a thing here in the Midwest, I am not sure how much they are actually salads. But with that said, point salad has you making a healthy er salad. You only have vegetables to work with, so it's gonna be healthier, but might not be that edible still. You get points, or so in this game, you're drafting cards, kind of like you were from uh, Ohanami, except you don't have a hand of cards. These are laid out on the table, and you can either take two face-up vegetables, or on the flip side, it has a scoring thing. And currently in the chat, they are saying that if it has a mayo base or whipping cream, it doesn't count as a salad. I would tend to agree with you. I think, well, for sure whipping cream is not a salad. Mayo base, maybe. It depends on how the mayo is handled in the salad. But with this game, back to this, as I'm sure I could probably discuss salads for quite a while, uh, it has you making a choice of either taking a card that's going to give you scoring at the end of the game. So the scoring might be for every two onions you get five points. I'm just making up what it is. Well then you're obviously going to be taking a lot of onions, but you could also take additional scoring cards that maybe one says for every onion you have it's worth a point, but for every tomato you have it's negative one. So it starts to shape the cards that you want to draft and how you're going to get points. And not super complex there, but the nice little twist that comes to it is that, say, you're the ones who are drafting onions. You really want onions, and there's a good onion scoring card on top of one of the piles. I can take a card from the column that that scoring card is in, and that scoring card will then flip down so that that scoring card is never available and get in that game. So that means I can block you a little bit from what you're trying to take. However, if I do it the wrong way, I might be giving myself negative points to make sure you don't get positive points, which may be worth it, but I don't I haven't seen a ton of hate drafting. It's just when you have like the option between two things that are good for you and one of them hurts the other person a little bit more, you'll go with that route. It's a game super fast, um, good filler. Definitely have set this up and played it multiple times in a sitting. My number two point salad. 
And finally, my number one. So my number one is a two-player only game, Hanamakoji. Hanamakoji is another very simple game. And for the most part, all of these small box games are pretty simple. However, I would say they all do something that's a little bit clever and a little bit different that sets them a step above other games that are trying to do the same thing. Hanmakoji is like that as well. It is a very simple tug of war game as you're an owner of a restaurant who is trying to get geisha to come to their establishment so that you'll be able to attract more customers. To do that, you have to be giving the geisha gifts. And whoever gets or gives more gifts to a given geisha gets their favor. That was decent alliteration there. But there's a few other little twists to it. This is just a card game, but every round you can only do one or you only do four things and at the end of the round you see where the favor of the geisha is so on your turn in a round you have like i said four thing one of four things you can do and once you've done one of those four things you can't do an, that one again until the next round you can play a card face down that will be used to win the favor of the geisha for you you can do two cards face down that will not be used. And then the ones that really start to hurt your brain are you can put three cards out face up and your opponent picks one of them. They put that next to one of the geisha the, that it matches to because all the gifts match to a specific geisha and you get to put out the other two. And then the final one is you put out two sets of two cards. Face up, your opponent picks which one they want, and you get the other. So you are really trying to figure out what your opponent might have, try and yeah, be able to read how they're playing to get that push and pull so that you have won the favor of more geisha. Now, it's possible to tie, it's possible you'll have to play a second hand or second round, but that's fairly rare. And to add a tiny bit more interest to it, so you start out with a hand of, I think it is six card, or five cards, and you draw a card at the start of your turn, so you have six. And that's not enough to get you through the total of 10 cards that you play each round so you're drawing stuff and it's determining how you play out a little bit and that means like no matter what you pick as your last action you'll be using every single card in your hand to do so and it's just it's super fast a lot to think about and it can seem a little bit random at times, but when you start to be able to see and like know the number of cards in there, and the number of cards everybody can easily tell. Some geisha want or have three cards in the deck, or three of them have two, two of them have three, one has four, and one has five. So you know a little bit about how many cards you've seen of certain things and it's just a really brain burning game it's so like with the put three cards face up and your opponent picks one and you get the other two that so much of what you're doing is when you play something out like that especially if it's early in the round 
you're trying to make your opponent make a decision for you or you're trying to based off of what you've seen your opponent play lead them down a specific direction of cards that they should take so that it sets you up and gives you the advantage on winning the favor of more of the geisha because there are a total of seven geisha and you have to win the favor of four to win the game or um, 11 points worth of geisha which would be the five a four the five four and a three any of the threes or twos or a five and both of the threes to win the game it is just such a good brain burning two player only game that really works well and feels like it goes really fast but there's a lot of interesting decisions to make in it so with that we have my top 10 small box games as i wrap this up here does anybody in the chat have a small box game that they really love so you can see when i'm talking small box that's the largest box that i included in the small box games so does anybody have any small box ones they think are fun um, drop them in the chat right now the one that just missed my list was age of war but yeah let me know what yours are tiny epic galaxies says studio Lanniston. i have yet to play any of the tiny epic games and Fatal Paper Cut says, is Deep Six D6 one of them? I mean, I feel like since the original would have been super tiny since it was print and play, I'd call that as a small game. I think it's a pretty small box. My brain equi equates it to the size of the Choose Your Own Adventure boxes, but I've never actually seen it in person, so I think it's probably smaller. It just looks or it has the same enough of the same look to that one that I'm like oh yeah these are the two games from the same line of games they are not Mountain Goats so Studio Lanniston is Mountain Goats one that was kickstarted I mean I guess it probably would have been a little while ago but like the start of 2020 I'm cur curious about that one. I think I'm, if I'm thinking of the right game, it's one that Glory Hound covered on their uh, Kickstarter crowdfunding show. So it looked interesting. It's it's really hard for me to back small games on Kickstarter, though. <laughs> I'm always like, no. If it doesn't even have to have minis, but if the game doesn't have some campaign or a lot of big feeling stuff, I'm always like, oh, do I need to back that one on Kickstarter? I probably should do that more and back less expensive campaign games, but I'm a sucker for those. So yeah, Studio Lannison says that uh, they do think it was originally on Kickstarter, probably covered by Glory Hound. So, with that, I'm going to wrap up. Thank you, everyone, for joining me. Thank you, Fatal Paper Cut and Studio Lanniston, for being in the chat. Hope that this was a fun top 10 to do. I know Fatal Paper Cut, it wasn't the top 10 you had picked. So, probably next week, I will be doing top 10 cooperative games. I will be signing off now. Uh, there's links as to how to find the other stuff that I do 
in the description below, as well as how to kind of support and promote the channel if you're willing to help with that. So give the video a thumbs up. Hopefully it was fun and bottoms up.